Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, it's an all-feature story edition of our show. After 32 years, Farm Week anchor Artis Ford is retiring. We'll talk with him about that and look back at one of his features from 15 years ago. In our Southern Gardening segment today, we'll conclude our Natchez series with a visit to Antebellum Dunleaf. In the Food Factor, pickles. You can make them out of more than just cucumbers. Our first feature story today is about sub-irrigated containers. These containers water themselves and can deliver outstanding vegetables and flowers. I've done away with the raised beds and I am off to the best start ever and I've vegetable gardened all my life. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. Today it's an all feature story edition of our show and it starts with a special announcement. My cohort, Artis Ford, a co-host here on Farm Week for some 32 years, is going to retire. Today marks his second to the last show with one more still to come and who would have thought this day would ever come? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little hard for me to believe too. I mean, Farm Week has been so much a part of my life that. It's going to take some time to adjust because Farm Week is just has a lot of hard and fast deadlines each week and so it just, you know, you always know what day Farm Week day right. is. You may not know what day Sunday is or your anniversary, but you know Farm Week day. Right. Well, this week on Farm Week, we have two feature stories for you, one old and one new from artists. And next week, we'll have even more on what will be his very last show. The only problem about television is that it doesn't care whether you're retiring or not. The show goes on regardless. Our first feature story today is a new one, the last one I'll produce for Farm Week. Keeping plants and gardens watered properly is one of the more tiring aspects of gardening. This story is about a method of watering plants consistently and it does it from the bottom up. They're called sub-irrigated containers. They don't do away with watering, but they can make the chore easier to handle while producing some outstanding vegetables and flowers. Artis, this year is my first year of total earth box gardening system. I've done away with the raised beds and I am off to the best start ever and I've vegetable gardened all my life. John Monroe of Purvis, Mississippi loves to share produce from his garden with the older residents of his community. None of it, however, actually grows in the ground. Monroe has 114 sub-irrigated containers. He grows vegetables including tomatoes, sweet corn, squash, okra, and butter beans. Monroe uses the Earthbox brand of sub-irrigated containers. You have such good uh, watering system there and the fertility is there. It has massive stalks on the plant all the way to the top. Research associate Scott Langlois works at Poplarville with the South Mississippi Branch Experiment Station of Mississippi State University. The station has used sub-irrigated containers as part of its display garden for three years. The common design theme across all of them is this innovative false bottom. Um, keeps the media up away from the water reservoir. These water reservoirs can hold two to three gallons of water. Uh, the media is in partial contact with the water, so there's a wicking action, which is why we call them sub-irrigated containers. The Earthbox brand comes with a plastic cover to slow evaporation and weed growth. Langlois notes there are several manufacturers, but he's found they perform equally. We found that they pretty much work the same uh, once they're planted. The different designs, what really makes them different, I think, is the design of the false bottom and how you add water. Some, such as the earth box, are simply just easier uh, to keep filled with water because it has this, this fill tube uh, coming out of the top of the box. You can't overwater a sub-irrigated container because the reservoir has an overflow opening. 
Extension horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman with Mississippi State University says this reservoir supports the greatest myth about sub-irrigated containers. Many gardeners think you water just once a week or less. The thing is with the sub-irrigated containers, it's just like growing in the ground management-wise. You still have to water at the same frequency that, that you normally would if your garden was in the ground. Bachman says two mature tomato plants with fruit can empty a container's reservoir in one day. They'll have a two to three gallon reservoir. Theoretically, two plants can drain all the water out of that reservoir, and that has to be replaced before, before the next day. Streamlining his garden watering is the reason Monroe says he made the switch from raised beds to sub-irrigated containers. He set up a drip irrigation system with timers to keep the bottom reservoirs filled. Uh, I'm out here every morning checking things, checking emitters, drippers, lines, whatever, and making sure that the water is adequate and the earth boxes themselves will tell you when they're full because they have overflow hole on them. So you can really streamline the, the water management here. Monroe placed his sub-irrigated containers on stands so harvesting and replanting takes place at a comfortable level. That's an advantage for gardeners with health problems. Where the boxes are up on, on tables or on benches. And so what you're doing is you're bringing that garden up higher. So if you've got a bad back, bad knees, you know, if, you're, if, you, if you need a scooter to get around the garden, all of a sudden the garden's not down there, it's, it's waist high much, much easier to garden, harvest, and enjoy what you're doing. The soil in a sub-irrigated container isn't soil at all. A quality peat moss-based potting mix is used for proper drainage. A granular agricultural grade fertilizer such as 101010 is added according to the manufacturer's directions. I recommend that the gardener uses a container mix, one that's primarily peat moss, because if you use regular soil, yeah, it, it, it will draw the water up, but what will happen is it will turn into mud. The potting mix, however, does not provide superior root support, so plants like corn or tomatoes have to be supported. Monroe uses a variety of trellises which are built into the container stands. I build substantial trellises and I have not had any problem with them because of that. You must tie up things like corn, okra, which you might not expect to do, but uh, it's growing in a very loose mix of a uh, potting mix and things can simply fall over. Soil-borne diseases are not a concern with potting mixes, so you can succession plant and use the same mix the next year. You don't, however, get a break with insect control. Whatever crop you're growing, you're still going to have, have those pests, so you're, you're going to have to address that issue. You can find plans on the internet to build your own sub-irrigated containers. What about the cost of manufactured ones? The ones that we've trialed here at the station, uh, for the consumer, you're looking at paying between uh, $25 and $50 generally. Um, now there are many options that can be purchased with these containers. Virtually every manufacturer offers um, a stand kit. Uh, wheels that can be added to the bottom. If you're rolling it around on the patio, that's convenient. This is a uh, upfront cost, and then it's a long-term investment is what I have found because I've got some earth boxes that have been in use for 15 years. So they handle sunlight very well. I've tried to build something like this myself, homemade job, and it was very successful for a year or two, and then the plastic disintegrates in the sun. It's recommended gardeners start small with sub-irrigated containers like Jerry Good of the Pine Belt Master Gardeners did. I have a very small yard and as my trees have grown in my yard, not much sun. So I bought one and put two tomato plants in it and very satisfied with it. There's a type of system that will help any gardener that's interested be successful and that's the key to the whole thing. It's going to help people be successful. You can watch this story again on sub-irrigated containers. You can find it on our Farm Week website, Facebook page, YouTube, or Twitter. The website is addressed as farmweek.msucares.com. 
Late in a couple of other notes from uh, John Monroe, he planted his corn March 1st and started to harvest 81 days later. Now he's down south in Purvis, so he can start a little earlier. Right. Uh, he picked his butter beans the other day, a bushel and a half off of nine containers. And that's the first picking. There'll be more butter beans I'm sure to his come. neighbors and friends are happy to hear about <laughs> yeah, that. I'm sure. You know, it's not a silver bullet. You gotta buy the container. You gotta build the trellises. But if you have a, just a patio you kinda wanna garden on, if you've got somebody with mobility problems that would like to garden, I mean, it, it's well made for that. Uh, Gary Bachman, I think he has 134 boxes. So Man. he is sold on them. Great story, artist. thanks. Well, time for our trivia quiz today on Farm Week. And with Artist Ford's Farm Week career about to end, the quiz has to do with Farm Week itself. Here's the question. We want to know how many seasons Farm Week has been on the air. Is the answer 36 seasons, 39 seasons, 40 seasons, or 42 seasons? I'll have that answer after today's Food Factor segment. We're going to pause for a short break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll have the Farm Week calendar and one more feature story for you. Our last feature story takes us back 15 years as we visit Gary and Lynn Miller of Macon. Their story is one of faith, perseverance, and love in the face of a life-changing accident. There are some moments in life where everything seems to be just right. Time slows down, and memories are made that will last a lifetime. That is, unless you've got fire ants. Then those memories can quickly turn into nightmares. It's time to bite back, Mississippi. Learn how to make your yard a safe place to play again at msucares.com slash bite back. Well, as before we get back to our last feature story, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. Landowners interested in passing land on to their heirs should attend the forestry workshop called Ties to the Land, Your Family Forest Heritage. The workshop also addresses those whose heirs may not be able to or are not willing to manage a tree farm. It takes place two successive Thursdays, July 7th and 14th. The location is the Tate County Extension Office on French's Alley in Senatobia. The hours are 6 to 8.30 p.m. The cost is $55 per person or $85 per couple. The annual Rice Field Day takes place Tuesday, July 19th. The location is the CAP Center at the Mississippi State University Delta Research and Extension Center at Stoneville. The program starts at 7.30 a.m. The field tours start at 8 a.m. Lunch will be served. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. This week on Southern Gardening, we wrap up our series on the gardens of Natchez, Mississippi. Extension horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman of Mississippi State University Extension takes us to Dunleith Historic Inn. It's famous for its 26 beautiful columns and its landscape built in 1856. Today we're visiting Dunleith Historic Inn, one of the grand mansions of Natchez. What do you say we explore the grounds a bit? One of the interesting ideas I like are the huge baskets hanging from the live oaks. Have you ever seen a basket hanging from a 30-foot chain with mixtures of vinca, salvia, and Swedish ivy hanging over the edges? Now moving around back, we find the courtyard surrounded by the perimeter boxwood parterre and plantings featuring heritage type flowers. In the center, the multi-tiered fountain adds the soothing sound of moving water. And there is a working cistern holding rainwater collected by the gutter system. The featured flowers are the old-fashioned zinnia elegans with their big pom-pom flowers. These zinnia feature long stems that are perfect for cutting and bringing inside to enjoy. The variety grown at Dunleith are Magellan with their enormous flower heads that don't require staking. 
The planting mixtures resemble a colorful carnival. Mexican petunia is a perennial that forms colonies about three feet tall. The strong stems add a distinctly vertical aspect wherever it's grown. The purple flowers are trumpet-shaped, about two inches in diameter, and displayed at the tips of the stems, and blooms like crazy during the heat of the summer and into the fall. Also on the grounds is a greenhouse that dates back to the 1790s and is actually heated with a fireplace in the winter. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. Gary says group tours of Dunleith are available. Individual tours are also available for restaurant patrons and those who stay overnight. When you mention the word pickle, most people think of the kind you make with a cucumber. In this week's episode of The Food Factor, Natasha Haynes with Mississippi State University Extension tells us that pickles can be made out of many kinds of produce and that they add a unique flavor twist at the same time. Most people are familiar with cucumber pickles, but what about okra, cabbage, or even watermelon rinds? They're all pickled using the same food preservation method and can be enjoyed all year round. Pickling requires attention to detail, so it's very important to follow USDA or Extension approved recipes very carefully to ensure the final product is safe to eat and maintains its color and quality. Pickles wouldn't be pickles, of course, without salt and vinegar, but not just any salt and vinegar will do. Use canning or pickling salt that doesn't contain iodine or non-caking material. Also, any vinegar used for pickling should be at least 5% acidic acid. Apple cider vinegar will give your pickles a milder flavor than white distilled vinegar. And remember to only use stainless steel, glass, or unchipped metal pans when heating pickling liquids to keep the salt and acid from reacting with the metal. For more recipe ideas, visit our new Food Factor Pinterest page. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. You can find the new Food Factor Pinterest board by going to pinterest.com slash the food factor. Time for the answer to today's trivia quiz on Farm Week. In case you've just tuned in, Farm Week's host, Artis Ford, is retiring next week. Our question, we wanted to know how many seasons Farm Week has been on the air. Well, the answer is B, 39 seasons. Farm Week will start its 40th season in October. Artis Ford has worked on Farm Week for 32 of those years. My Farm Week colleague, Artis Ford, is known for finding feature stories that teach and inspire in unique ways. Our last feature story today is an example of that. It first aired back in 2001, 15 years ago. It's about Gary and Lynn Miller of Macon. They had always farmed in addition to their off-farm jobs. Earning a living farming seemed to be an impossibility after Gary suffered a terrible accident at his off-farm job in 1980. The Millers don't set themselves up as examples, but they hope that by sharing their experience, they can benefit others. You can do this. No such word as can. Beautiful song. Yes, they all are. There's no such word as can. Take it out of your vocabulary if it is, okay? Which one are we doing first? Uh, we're going to do that, son. We're gonna do Can't. The, uh, it's a word Gary Miller lives without every day, whether it's directing the choir at his church or his hay baling crew. Miller and his wife Lynn have built a reputation for growing quality hybrid Bermuda grass hay on their Macon, Mississippi farm. That in itself would make the Millers worthy of mention, but there's more to their story. It's apparent at first glance that Miller has lost his left arm, but the man walking up and down the hay field also has no feet. Gary Miller is a triple amputee, the result of being electrocuted on the job in 1980. First thing is just don't give up. Uh, be patient uh, and, and just keep taking one step forward at a time. Miller was working as an electric power company lineman when he was hit with 7,200 volts. He spent seven months in Texas undergoing burn treatments and his first round of rehabilitation. 
Miller farmed before his accident, and Lynn said it was apparent early that Gary wanted to do it again. Oh, he was still in the wheelchair when he thought he was going to run a business with the, he wanted to go get on that tractor. It would be unrealistic and untruthful to say Miller simply healed, climbed on the tractor, and became a respected hay farmer. He says there were difficult, painful days and times of depression. The Millers advise any couple in a similar situation to stay committed to each other. Just don't give up. Uh, set yourself a goal and try to try to reach that goal. Don't give up on your spouse. I'd say that to the ladies. Just pray and hang in there and don't give up. While Gary's goal was to farm again, it didn't happen just because he wished it. He first discovered he had to accept that his body was not the same as it was before the accident. You're going to have to learn how to rethink on the way to do things uh, because there's no way in the world you can go back and do it like you used to. I know when I first got back home, we were row cropping and I went to work on some a combine. And I said, well, I know how I used to do it. And when I got up on there, I saw I couldn't. There wasn't any way in the world. Miller says no matter how willing an amputee is to return to the workforce, he cannot do it without good quality prosthetic limbs. He says an amputee must have an acceptable degree of comfort while he's working. There are different kinds of prosthetic limbs, so an amputee may have to push his insurance provider to go the extra mile to develop what he needs. He's still got to have the, the comfort and good quality prosthesis to do this. And it, it, it's cost, it's expensive, it's, it really is. But you have to make a sacrifice. Miller began to think about the hay business in 1991 after he and Lynn bought the farm across the road from their house. They planted pine trees on some of the land. They eventually converted the natural grass pastures into the present 80 acres of hybrid Bermuda grass hay fields. I saw this as one thing to help me, I saw to get myself going again. Uh, I, I, I looked at it as a challenge. It would keep me busy. And because the longer you sit and think about yourself, you don't want to do that. When Lynn isn't teaching second graders at Scuba, she helps Gary bale hay. They get four to five cuttings a year off the non-irrigated hay fields. The hay is cut every four weeks to keep the protein content as high as possible. The goal is get nine tons of, of hay per acre is what our goal is. We had not quite reached it yet, but we're not going to give up on it. It does a good job of uh, testing his hay for quality, and that's what we try to stress to our hay producers is get that hay tested and see what the protein content is running. And he does a good job of uh, really looking at the small parts of a hay production and he puts it together to uh, make, you know, make an outstanding product for ho horse producers and for cattle producers. The Mississippi Agribility Project has also worked with Miller. It's a partnership of the Mississippi State University Extension Service and Easter Seals of Mississippi. It helps people with agricultural occupations who have been disabled. Agribility helped to adapt some of Miller's equipment, including this special power takeoff coupling. It can be operated with one hand instead of two. To show his thanks, Miller speaks at agribility meetings, sharing his experiences. I feel like he let me survive this for one for a reason, for a reason. Uh, if it can help someone else, that's fine. Uh, I hope it does. But I don't consider myself a hero by no, by no, by any means. Good to see each of you here this morning. I invite you to get a hymnal and turn with us to 545. Let's stand and sing all three verses, please. 545. No one would hold it against Gary Miller if he took it easy on Sundays, but he also volunteers as the music director for the Independent Methodist Church in Macon. Lynn plays the piano. It makes some people uncomfortable to talk about matters of faith, but you can't tell Gary and Lynn's story without it. Miller credits God with his survival and recovery. When you start going up, when you had it, we go up a little bit. You got to get, you got to come in. You got to say, "I'm standing." You guys are gonna come in on their part. You know, he's drinking my faith uh, because it's no doubt in my mind. If it hadn't been for Lord, I wouldn't be here today. 
I, I believe that's strong. He had something else for me to do. Miller doesn't consider himself notable, but he is willing to tell his story if it will benefit another person. If I can help someone by doing this, that's, that's for the better. And that's the way I look at it. And you can watch this story again on Gary and Lynn Miller at the Farm Week website, farmweek.msucares.com. You can also watch Farm Week stories on YouTube. Artis, I understand you spoke with Gary and Lynn. Yes, I did. Uh, and Gary is still hay farming 15 years <laughs> later. He said he had 2,500 square bales right now that he needed to get to Man. Newton, Mississippi. Uh, he's still leading church choirs, and Lynn is still playing the piano. And they're serving now at Concord Baptist Church at Macon. It was great to hear his voice. He sounded just the same, and I don't think he's ever going to stop. Well, glad to hear they're doing so well. Well, we are at the end of this week's edition of Farm Week. Once again, in case you are just tuning in, Farm Week's Artist Ford is retiring. We will have a special edition of Farm Week next week for you, one honoring Artist Ford's last show after 32 years. We will be stepping back in time as we review the career of Farm Week's longest serving anchor. You might be surprised to find out just how young he was when he started. For the rest of the Farmer crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good week.